life. Okay. Hello, 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 everyone. Hold on. Oh. Hold it. Hello, 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 everyone. Uh, good afternoon, if you are on the East Coast. Uh, my name is Tanika Sitchin Spruce, and I am I'm the co director of the LEAD program, which is um, a leadership program for uh, BIPOC uh, disabled individuals and, um, and parents of children with disabilities. And uh, we are, of course, part of the Michigan Disability Rights Coalition. Um, so I decided to do um, an event today, uh, a special talk with our own MDRC own Reina Garcia, uh, because today or this month is uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, and uh, I think this would be you know, an excellent time uh, for you know for you to uh, see and learn more about what it's like to be uh, a, a Latina a woman uh, with a disability, and so uh, that's why we're here uh, today. So um, welcome, Reina. Uh, hi, Tamika. Thank you so much for the invitation to celebrate the Heritage Month, Hispanic Heritage Month. Thank you so much. Yes, no problem. It's, it's my pleasure. So let's get started. We only have about, you know, for, uh, what, 58 minutes to go. <laughs> so I'm gonna make sure it's good. And if you have any questions in the chat uh, or have questions for Reina, just you know, post those questions. Um, and also, if you need a uh, closed caption um, in Facebook, there should be a CC um, caption available in the video so you can uh, understand what's being said. And so let's get started. So um, Raina, can you tell me uh, how, well, first question, can you tell me how did you acquire your, your disability? Uh, well, sorry, I just lost my, <laughs> my accident, sorry. Well, uh, I, when I was six years old, I remember uh, that I visited one of my relatives, my, my aunt, uh, my mom's sister. We went there, we were so excited to visit her and we sleep over and Next day in the morning, I remember I couldn't feel my legs and I was like uh, thinking what's going on. And I called my mom and I told her, I don't feel my legs. I don't know what's going on. She tried to give me a massage and to feel relaxed and probably to start walking, but that never happened. And um, she told me, okay, let's go outside. Probably you need to sit, sit down, uh, you know, down the sun and feel the energy. You're going to feel okay. And, and yes, I start walking. Um, but days after, I can, I can start feeling different. Like my legs were very uh, weak and I felt very often. And it's how my, uh, my journey starts when the polio, uh, this virus, entered into my body. In that time, I, I was uh, born in the 70s. I was uh, six years old. So at uh, that time, a lot of kids in, in around the world got the virus. Uh, so I was one of the, those kids that I got the virus and affected my left leg. And it could all develop, my, le my left leg could, couldn't develop uh, in the right way. So because... Uh, for that reason, for the virus, that um, uh, that is start my my journey, um, and I have memories of that. Uh, how hard it was for me to walk, and and you know how my parents start dealing with that situation. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Though no, had to be, you know, something experiencing that, you know, being able to walk it, you know, those type of things, and, and all of a sudden, you know, and you said you were, how old? 
I was six years old. Yeah, okay. six years old when yeah. all my journey started with uh, polio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm sure it probably was kind of like a faint memory. Can you really, do you really remember all of it? Or six years old, like something you can remember uh, something is okay. Yeah, I have I have memories before the um, I got the the virus, and I have the memories after. That. But it's specific that they always it was in my memories, like. Um, that way, how I felt, uh, it was very frustrating because I wanted to walk and I couldn't walk. And then, um, yeah, and this how uh, I didn't understand what happened. I was like, why, why I couldn't walk? Like, and and then I perfectly remember like um, uh, my memories before that I was a, a kind of little girl, like play a lot, like like when I remember when my mom opened the door and I started running and I, I, I love to slide on the, the, um, the ground. And I was like a very active girl. But after my, my uh, I got the, this virus in my, in my body, like got the polio. Yeah, I was like my world changed, everything changed in, in my life, uh, obviously. But I I saw a lot of kids around my neighborhood with um, you know with the same uh, same uh, disease, and then um, I I just was uh, I I saw now um, I was just lucky, like I could keep walking because a lot of my friends that I had they. They couldn't walk. They have to use uh, crutches, or they have to use wheelchairs, and it was very hard for them to walk. And yeah, they paralyzed most of their their body. So I was like, the how is how I I felt at that time. I was a little girl, but I I, I observed a lot. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 So how was it um, growing up in Mexico? Uh, like what city, uh, you know, were you from? And, you know, just give us a picture of what it's like to grow up in Mexico. Yes, well, my parents, uh, they uh, they were from Guerrero, from the south of Mexico. And the city that I was living, in, it's, the name is a little um, hard to say in English because some people, they cannot pronounce uh, Nezahualcoyot. Nezahualcoyos is the name of one of the poets, Me Me Mexica poet, and then uh, he was a very smart, uh, uh, you know, leader at that time, and is a, is the name of the city, and um, and this is a small city. Um, the people from the, from there who are right there is from other places from Mexico, so it was immigrants. <laughs> From around Mexico, all around Mexico, even Spain, people from Spain was living there. I remember one guy who, who has a, a business. He was from Spain, so it was a uh, all the my neighborhood was from different. Uh, the my neighbors were from different people from in another around Mexico, and I raised there, and and, and we call Nesa to make the short name Nesa. Um, and I was a, it was a very nice, in, in the beginning, I remember it was kind of, we don't have a electricity, we don't have a lot of things, but we have something very special. It was like the people there. I really love my neighbors. You can meet different types of accents and uh, the way that they talk, they, they say good morning to you. It's a, it's, it was very kind of, uh, diverse uh diverse place where i raised um and i really love it uh in my childhood i have a lot of good memories there yeah yeah that's awesome that's awesome thank you for that wonderful picture so as a person or as a child with a disability what were some of the you know services or you know support or you know, school, what was those type of, you know, how was that? What was that like? The, you know, um, well, yeah. it, uh, when I got my disability, I, I, the only support that I had, it was my parents. 
because they were very worried about me. It was the only support that I had at that moment, especially because they want me to be okay. They want me to let that I feel like I was a normal kid and I can do everything that other kids can do. But unfortunately, that not happens. So I remember uh, how hard my parents uh, were um, trying to get money to took me to the specialist uh, uh, for the orthopedist and I start uh, having my special shoe and it was expensive I remember and they tried their best to I got what I need but uh, I I can say my parents were the most um, uh, they they support me the most and um but I also I have a I have a, a teacher in my first grade. I remember from my first grade teacher, he called me champion all the time. He knew about, now I understand he knew about my disability, but also he observed a lot how smart I was because I wasn't a smart girl since I was a little girl. I remember that I really love to write perfectly and I love to learn math and everything. And um he observed that and he told all the kids. I remember one day he told me to stand up and to come in the front and told all the class that uh, that my new name was champion, that champion. She is a champion. And that specific moment made me feel so special. And it's how the, the voice of his, um, the nickname that he uh, put, put over me, he, uh, he helped me in, all my um, my journey as a girl with disability, because obviously in Mexico at that time when I raised in the 70s, it was not really culture about disability. Kids were very cool with me and people. And I, uh, I remember when I walked from my house to school, school to the house, people call me names, and it was they were so mean with me. And but. I remember my 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 teacher of first grade. He, when he na named, give me a name as a the champion. I was a champion of the class, and everybody they told everybody you need to call her the champion, and it's how I I I think um, that helped me to survive to survive because I have the um, specific moment when he made me feel proud of myself, like. Tell me you're smart, no matter what, you're smart, and you need to keep going and don't listen to them. And it was a message from him to me. So I think that support from my first um, first grade teacher it was very important in my life. Yeah, that's that's you know glad to hear that you know glad to hear that there you know was a teacher to you know the have you know the. Um, the disability and, and such, you know, and they the champion. And so was there at any point like uh, within your town, um, any like special classrooms for kids with uh, physical disabilities or, uh, or uh, cognitive disabilities or anything like that that you know of? Can you repeat the, the question again, Tamika, please? Yeah. Now say um, so when you uh were there any in your town, any uh like a special like a classroom or for kids with specific specifically disability or disabled, or did you go to any uh like classroom with kids with disabilities in your town or did they just integrate you into uh you know with the regular with the peers no we don't unfortunately is it was not anything to help us or to identify kids with disabilities how we can support in the school and integrate or include them it was totally the opposite thing in the school like um the only thing that I, I remember perfectly, I have a friend, uh, her name was Guadalupe, I remember her very, very well. Like uh, she has the same issue like me, but uh, she was affected for both, both feet. 
uh, the fits, uh, and then um, and I remember their parents. Um, they they were like a kind of um, you know they were not low income. They have money, <laughs> and they they start making surgeries for her very early, and you know trying to she got better and I remember her perfectly it's the only thing that I have in the in the beginning that because in Mexico's different school is like uh, first grade to sixth grade is how it, it goes and then at that time is how I met her until third grade because she moved out but um, we don't have anything we don't have any resources nothing anything like can help us to uh, be included the only thing that I remember <laughs> But it was, it, well, I wanted to share because sometimes um, it's good to share a story. I remember my teacher from sixth grade. She really hates me. I remember she hates me because I have a disability. And she really always tried to not let me go to PE for physical education, do my activities, because she stopped me on the door and she said, okay, you cannot do her sex size, so you gotta stay inside. And she let me stay with another girl who she was uh, very, in a, she was poor at that time. And um, both of us only, we were watching on the window how everybody had fun and things like that. But it's how it was culturally, not any education for the teachers, treating us differently or better as a people, with, as, as a students with disabilities, it was not any resources at that time. Yeah, uh, if we need any resources, it needs to be outside of the school, but it, was, it needs to be private resources because I don't think uh, the, um, my, my dad have, um, in, in his, in his uh, job, he got, a, um, you know, insurance. Uh, but uh, the insurance it doesn't cover all the treatment that I needed, so it was it's, it was so complicated to get any kind of resources. But uh, not not any education for the teachers, not any education for parents for parents or kids, and we were like totally alone with our disability. Yeah, I understand that, and thank goodness you had you know great parents too. That as you said before that you know, treated you as if you didn't have a disability, make sure you, you know, had fun and had, you know, uh, a, a childhood. So that's me, you know, I think, you know, even thinking about my own parents, how, you know, it's so imperative to have parents, uh, you know, who support you and love you and, you know, let you be a child and, you know, don't put a whole lot of, you know, stipulations or limitations. <laughs> Do you, you know, because then, you know, you grow up, you're like, oh, I can, you know, do anything. I can conquer the world, you know, but that comes from having, you know, parents that help, you know, help you during that process. So uh, I think that's a takeaway, you know, that we all can learn from. And so if you can uh, just share with us uh, when you came to America, you know, how was that like what was that process and that I was that for you well uh, uh, my my story about when I came to America it was uh, related with my disability I got I started growing up I was teenager and uh, one of the things is like uh, when are you when you are teenager you know start going to high school high school is like who is the most popular you know and you need to look beautiful. And it's a time when you think about relationships or got a boyfriend, something like that. And I remember perfectly that I felt like I was, I was not beautiful. My self-esteem was totally down. And it was hard because it was a lot of pressure for me to be in high school. I got accepted in Mexico. I told, I told you it's a different ways from here in the United States, in Mexico, you need to apply to go to high school. They need to accept you. And it's a very complicated process. It's not like here in the United States, you um, you know, apply for the school that you want and you can get there. And, and it's not so difficult, but in Mexico it's difficult. Sometimes you wanna be part of the 
university, the most popular university in Mexico, the best university in Mexico, um, you wanted to go to high school that is connected with the university. And I, I applied for that, that school and I got accepted in one of the schools. And it was hard. Yeah, it was like, uh, I cannot handle that. I being, being a teenager with disability will not support in many ways. I, I felt like I couldn't, I didn't fit in, in, in the system. I didn't fit in, in, the, in the school and in any place. I, I got a, a lot of depression because during, um, I, and that depression came from, um, from middle school that I got, I, I have an experience to be discriminated from the school. And after that, I, I remember my brother told me, you gotta continue, thanks to him because um, he encouraged me to continue studying. And that's what I applied and I got accepted to the high school. And, but still I, I, I got with me, carrying with me my back and my shoulders, all the experience with us uh, discriminated with former disability. And um, it was a very set, set moments that I have, that I had at that time. And I remember that I said, I'm, uh, I, I wanted to go to another, con to another country, to another place and, and start all over and start a new chapter. And yeah, I, I got invited from my uncle to come over when I, almost turned 18, but I, I applied for my visa to come here and I was so excited. And, and I just came to the country and visit my family. But uh, yeah, I was thinking I'm gonna just, I, I have plans just to stay for a little bit and that happens. I really like here and I feel free. And yeah, it's how my journey start like coming to this place I was, I, I think I left Mexico with a lot of feelings, with a lot of, um, my heart was uh, breaking apart because I don't feel like it was enough uh, respect for us as a people with disability. It was no resources, it was nothing, anything, only the support from my parents and my family at that time. Yeah, but it was kind of, I was mad. I was with a lot of mixed feelings when I arrived to this country, but I, I, I started a new chapter here when I was too young and studying, studying English and, and I started building my dreams here. And it's how now I'm here in this beautiful country. Yes, thank you. Everybody has, you know, a story and such, and, you know, America, even though, you know, it's not, perfect at all, you know, we have a laundry list of things that, you know, America needs to be better in, but, you know, thankfully with the Americans with Disabilities Act, you know, we do have some, you know, protection here as, um, you know, people with disabilities. So, you know, that's good that we, you know, are kind of like a refuge. And I think, you know, that we, you know, need to continue to be, uh, you know, that refuge for, you know, others, you know, uh, you know, in across the world, including, you know, in Mexico and South America. And, you know, uh, we need to continue to be that refuge and, and for, uh, for people, especially those with uh, disabilities. Um, so I know that you are artists, and we do see uh, some of the uh, paintings and things uh, uh, behind you. So if you can just kind of describe that painting uh, behind you and you know, just physically describe what it is and, uh, and if, that's, if that's your painting, correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, well, before I go to my art, I wanna share a little bit about um, when I arrived, I arrived to this country, uh, one of the places that I really loved and I enjoyed, it was New York City. I, I don't remember, I was too young, 18 years old when I arrived to New York City because I traveled uh, in different places. I arrived in Michigan, in Lansing, it was my first place and I appreciate my uncle who gave me the opportunity. And then I traveled to California, Florida, but I, 
uh, when I arrived to New York, I remember it was an amazing um, place to live uh, and to heal. I, I feel like uh, a lot of things I heal in New York because it's kind of how I connect with myself and I start my process to accept myself and forgive myself about many things, about the past, about how the reason that I came to this country. And um, I already have in Michigan like uh, almost 17, 18 years here. I live in New York for 15 years and here in Grand Rapids for 18, almost 18 years, so 18 years. And I can say Grand Rapids helped me to close this cycle of my life that it was very important to say this is this is a person who I am, no matter what my disability or my body, I need to accept myself. And um, I think Grand Rapids is uh, the land to welcome me, um, to totally understand life is like accepting everything, not leaving the past. Because yeah, my past it was a lot of resilience and still is a resilience, but uh, with my disability, I hugged myself as my little girl. And I said, it's time to keep going. So that's why I, I appreciate all the people to support me with this transition to understand that I have to accept myself and love myself and now how I can help others with my story. Because yeah, my beautiful city and at the moment in the 70s, they don't have anything to offer to me. But coming to this country, I, I opened my mind and many, uh, of many things, but I, I learned from many people who helped me to this transition. I remember perfectly in New York, um, this mentor I have, Ray, he was a writer a Chicano writer, and remember when he told me many times, you are so beautiful, Reina, you have a lot of potential. And I know one day you are going to discover that because now you don't understand, or probably you don't want to accept it, that you are uh, so smart and you have a lot of potential. In many ways, you are very artistic, you are very creative. And now that I'm here in Grand Rapids doing this interview, I honor his memory because he was one of that people who encouraged mm -hmm. me to, I remember when he invited me with her wife in Connecticut, <clears throat> they live in Connecticut and he told me, you need to start swimming. And I told him, I don't want to use very soon because I don't like people see my um, disability. And he told me, nobody's gonna put attention to you. You are the only person who are worried about that. And he was right, he was right. And, and yeah, I, I have, I can say um, this country opened for me the doors and hearts for many people who support me. And I feel the freedom after I accept myself and it's the message that I bring to people who have disabilities so far and who have dis kids with disabilities. It's a process. And I hopefully nobody can take long time um, to enjoy life because I take a lot of time in my life, like, I was almost in the 40s when I, I, I took the decision that it's, it's time to feel this freedom from all those voices that I have in my childhood and my um, teenage age. And because it wasn't true, I was smart since my, my first grade teacher told me that I was smart and he called me champion. And it's how I feel as a champion today, thanks to these people who encourage me and telling me beautiful things in the moments that nobody cares. Yeah. But now I forgot your question because <laughs> I wanted to share that, that part of my life. Yeah. You know, that, that, that's beautiful. And I think that is something that, you know, every person, you know, woman, uh, you know, person with disability, you know, whether you were born with it or you acquired it, you know, at a later uh, stage of your life, that you have to, you know, life is much more easier when you just learn to, you know, surrender and learn to, you know, accept, 
and you know love yourself and holy you know you can define you know who you are you know where you you know a person of faith you know god can define who you are you can't live your life based on you know other people's you know perceptions you know of you and, and, and their ideas of you you know you have to you know, become free from that. So yeah, that's definitely, I can 100%, you know, relate to, you know, what you're saying, um, you know, as a person with disability and as a, you know, a woman, um, you know, as well, and a woman of color. So, uh, you know, I think that I know, you know, people watching, uh, you know, they can relate to it as well. And it's definitely a lesson that is, you know, need to be learned to just love and accept yourself, you know, as who you are, you know, life gets more easier, you know, like per se, like, you know, yeah. life, you know. Yeah. So, uh, I thought to talk about your art. Yeah. Uh, you know, Let's I talk saying, about my art. Uh, yeah. Okay. I wondered if I can share my screen. I'm going to show you my website and I have pieces of my art there, but I'm going to tell you about this piece that is um, in my back uh, behind me. Uh, that piece, uh, it was part of one of the exhibition in Mary Free Bear. Uh, Mary Free Bear here in Grand Rapids offer an exhibition to people with disabilities every April. It's in April, April to June. And I really, I, I always say thank you to, to people who think about us because this uh, amazing exhibition, they uh, support us. Um, we can bring three pieces of art and we can sell it and they give us all the, all the money for us. So, and in this exhibition, I, I met a lot of artists and a lot of people who um, create the art, but it's very interesting because most of the people that came, they were people like they have a normal life, but they, for some reason they have an accident, car accident, most of them have car accidents and their, their life, you know, change. And, but through the art, they express how they feel, how their life uh, it is. And it's a beautiful exhibition. I hopefully, I can invite you next year to this exhibition. And I'm going, in December is the time that I start preparing my art for that exhibition. I love to participate every year. So at that time I did this, um, this artwork thinking um, this, uh, the eye is one of my sketching when I was around 50 years old. I did a sketch and I find it and, um, you know, I was looking through my, all my things that I had and I, I find a sketch and I said, okay, it's time to do it. And the art piece about this, I sketch, <laughs> I was sketching. And um, yeah, it's always like, um, it means, uh, Always, I have to start observing, and, and you know the waves that you see around. It's like uh, the the experiences that I had every time uh, in my life, and also, um, it I did I did a kind of collage. Uh, it's a mixed media because I, I did a collage, and this picture that I have here is my first time uh, participating in a race with this organization that organized the race for people with disability. And then it was my first time that I was uh, racing and it's how I felt like one of my goals is like show the world, this is who I am. Because it was hard for me sometimes to show my, uh, my disability, use uh, shorts or use, uh, um, you know, skirts. And that day, I remember the morning when I arrived and I saw, other people with disability and I was like this is amazing this is who I am and I feel it's how I experience that freedom and I hopefully I can sh I can inspire other people to feel like that proud of your disability and it's how something that I learned here with with you Tamika and working with Michigan Disability Rights Coalition I feel proud of be a woman with disability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. This, it is beautiful, you know, uh, picture and everything. How did you so? How did you learn to uh, draw and you know, how did you get into art? You said you created um, some of it in high school. Uh, 
yeah, I, when um, in middle school, when I got, uh, I had the experience to be discriminated in the school, um, my brother uh, told me to go to his school, to, to his high school, and uh, he asked the art teacher if I can go in the afternoons to learn how to draw and paint, and then um, he accepted. <laughs> And it was how all my journey start, uh, you know, all my journey start um, with being an artist because my brother knew that I really love, um, you know, I really love to, to, to do art. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. And if you, and I know it's probably therapeutic for you, you know, as well, because I'm, I'm an artist as well, not like drawing, but like scripts and, you know, film and things like that. So is it therapeutic for you, you know, your um, artwork? Yeah, it is, especially when I, um, uh, when I'm doing the, um, I do ceramics also. I love to do ceramics, but I, any kind of, things that I do when I do my, I create my art, when I also write poetry or when I that do the, I'm, you know, touching the, the clay and do transforming the clay in something beautiful. It's very, very, very like, it, it, it helped me a lot in many ways, mental health, emotionally, <laughs> in every way. But I'm trying to look for my, um, I'm trying to look for my uh, website and I, I cannot find it. So I'm gonna yeah, if you it. can just put it, um, you know, you can send it to me later or you can think of it as you're talking and put it in, a, in the chat or the, in, uh, the Zoom chat and then I'll, you know, post it. Um, yeah, I, wanted, you know, I wanted to share some artwork that I have related with my disability. That's what I wanted to share. It's right here. I found okay. it. So I'm gonna share my, this is my website. And, um, and you can check, um, I'm gonna check the gallery. The gallery has a lot of um, things. Um, this is my art, basically what I create. This is part of my journey. Oh, wow. How I feel like, uh, uh, this is visionary. Visionaries, a woman. For me, that's a woman that I have inside of me. With I have a lot of vision about my dreams, how to accomplish them, and not stopping my life, doing my life just because of the disability. So I'm an activist too. So I just create this piece um, at a time when uh, we have a lot of issues uh, with immigration and a lot of deportation. So I create this. Piece I said it says stop forced immigration, and then this is um this is a series of three pieces. Um, uh, the name is uh, Voices of Hope, and Voices of Hope is a series of three pieces that talks about a journey as an immigrant when they come to this country. Um, and this and this piece is this piece is reflecting the a person who is. Uh, leaving uh, her, uh, leaving his uh, land behind, family behind, uh, or everything behind his story to start a new journey. Obviously, our journey is not easy when we arrive here. We, we sometimes we think it's going to be easy to come, get a job, and you know, be stable here. But that that is not happening because you miss your family and you lost a lot of things when you come to this country. And this piece is the last piece from um, uh, this series. And the, the, the woman in blue, it means immigrants. Uh, we keep a stand that they keep going with no lies, but the, the wings from the angels behind or the woman is not because she's an angel, it's because we find people that they are angels in our lives here in this country. It's, a bad, it's still good people helping immigrants uh, with, in, in different ways. So, and this is talking about the same thing about my disability, my identity, my culture, my identity. Um, and it's how I express uh, Mother Earth, how important it is for me. And this is, um, American dream. I, I dedicate this uh, to the 
um, in the past for um, in the past for the the kids they were um, dreamers. I did yeah. painting for them, American dream for them. And then this is about um, talking about um, domestic violence. So yeah, it's it's part of my in my work. My work. Uh, people can visit my uh, my website, and then um, also the cultural part that I offer. And part of my work is uh, do the cultural part and um, cultural work. It's right here. I cannot go to this. I cannot go to this part. Anyways, I don't know what happened. But uh, I, I do my cultural work in my community outreach. So it's, this is my website. People can visit my website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's, that's beautiful. Your heart is, is, is so great. I guess it's so therapeutic. You know, it's a way of communication. It can communicate things that words, you know, cannot be, you know, used, you know, how you steal this stuff. So yeah, definitely. And I posted it on uh, the Facebook as well. So um, it's your website is radasgallery.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And also right. they can they also they can visit me to my Facebook page, Reina Garcia's Art. Also they can visit me there. They can check it out what I have, my activities and everything. Yeah, in the page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And so uh, we only have like a few minutes, like 16, 17 minutes left. And if you have any questions, you know, for Raina, uh, you know, please uh, post it up in the Facebook, um, at DRC's Facebook. Um, so what, how did you join the LEAD project? How did you get here? at uh, FDRC? Well, I, I met uh, Brianna Alexander in one of the um, trainings for, um, um, I, I'm thinking in Spanish, so sometimes I got oh. <laughs> it. Was thinking, okay. I am trying to translate very fast. Um, racial equity training. I remember we spent two, day, two years in the training and after that, uh, she was not working in Michigan Disability Rights Coalition. She was working for another organization. And when she started working and she was looking for people with disabilities in Grand Rapids, two of um, friends, two friends of mine uh, referred my name to her. And she was very excited because she knows she knows me from the training. And it's how everything I started. She invited me to be part of the facilitator training, facilitator's training in Lansing. And it's how I met amazing people there in the in the place. I remember when I entered to the to the room, and I saw people for, with different disabilities. It was powerful and impact me in my life. Uh, meeting everybody there, and it's that way how I met you. I remember I met you. I met you. I met Homer, and um. I remember also that three ladies in wheelchair leading the the training, and uh, I remember well. Jamie was one of the ladies who was spending time with me, and another I remember that name of the other lady. But Jamie and everybody made me feel very welcoming, and I met people around me, and uh, I saw I understand at that time what accommodations means and. It was different kind of accommodation in that, in that room. And it was very interesting, everything. And it's how my journey started. It inspired me a lot, that training. The training, it was something special for me because I was feeling like how the universe worked in my life. The, like, um, if I was there, it was for a reason. And now I understand why. And since then, I start um, my relationship, a uh, trust relationship with Brianna, and I have a lot of ideas how to do things in Grand Rapids with the community. And uh, you know, uh, the pandemic started in 2020 when we have 
or plans to start or cohorts in, for the Latino community. We have our open house finally in uh, uh, February the 2020. And um, I was so excited. I was so excited about to start doing uh, something. And we went, when we get ready, we don't have anything because the pandemic started. And then the good thing from the pandemic is like, uh, we were planning to do everything in person in Grand Rapids, but um, everything changed and we start working in Zoom and we connect with more people around Michigan. And that it was very an amazing experience to start connecting with parents. Uh, offering the cohort for parents with kids with disabilities, Latinos that speak Spanish in all over Michigan. It was a blessing from the universe. So it was like, okay, we have a, we have a crisis, but we need to see the, the bright part of all this work that I connect with those families. And yeah, my work in MDRC, always I can say is open the doors for many, uh, many ideas that I had, but those ideas came from my own experience as a, woman, a disabled woman, because I had parents that always felt guilty about my situation. They feel like um, it, was, it was their fault. And that, those feelings affect me a lot because I saw them suffering a lot. And when I'm, uh, I'm around those, uh, I was around those parents in the two last cohorts, and I hear them, I can I share my story and I told them, no, it's not your fault. You are doing a lot for them, for your kids, and you love them and you can keep going. And then that is that connection with the parents and accomplish one thing in my life that for a reason I'm here in Grand Rapids, for a reason I met uh, Brianna and I'm part of MBRC and now my mission, my life of mission is to support all these families uh, through my story or through my, um, through you because MBRC, um, the great things that does for my community is is something like no, never, nobody never asked me before, like, uh, what do you mean for the community? Tell me, tell us how we can support them. And I always receive the support resources. And yeah, like today we have another training that is for the general public. Um, the messenger, uh, influential messenger training is getting more uh, popular, more like people are excited. And today this group of women that I invited to, to, to for tonight, they are very excited. Last night, uh, one of the ladies told me, Reina, Tell me you need volunteers. Tell me what do you need? How we can help? How we can support the community, disabled community, and Latino disabled community? And some some parents asking me, do you need something? Do you need some help? I really that made me feel like uh, even it's not easy to talk about this topic. Community is responding because I had I had all, um, already three years working so hard to bring the masses to the Latino community. Little by little, we start building that relationship with the community and I'm so excited. And I can say, Tamika, you are an amazing director of this program, the LEAD program, and that I'm part of it. And um, I'm so proud to be part of this uh, program. And thank you so much, Tamika, for all your support. Um, you are an amazing woman, always inspiring me, having a lot of patience with me. <laughs> but it, uh, yeah. Tamika has a lot of discipline always when we are working together. And uh, thank you for the team. I think I, I cannot do, I cannot make this happen since I don't have any kind of support. Yeah, but thank you so much. Oh, thank you, thank you. And I know we have, about 10 minutes left, so I have two quick questions <laughs> yeah. if you can answer. Um, so the first question is, what is uh, some of the challenges doing, you know, as you said that you uh, do the uh, Spanish speaking cohort for the parents, you know, and it's such do influential training. So uh, on disabilities, in Grand Rapids, so what are the, some of the um, issues or issues that you see parents, um, especially speaking parents, are experiencing? And then the last question is, what is 
the, I guess, two headed question, the misconceptions, but yet the beauty of being Hispanic. Okay, you have three, three <laughs> questions. <laughs> Very nice. I'm gonna try my best to use 10 minutes because I I wanted to um, finish sharing this video that is important for me to share with the community. But anyways, um, the one of the, the issues that I, I wanted to mention this issue when I'm doing this work uh, um, with the Latino community, the, the biggest issue is to find the parents uh, who, has, who have kids with disabilities. It's very hard to find them, it, but it's more harder they, when they, um, to convince them to say yes to the cohort. <laughs> it's the worst, it's not the worst, it's the most difficult part. So it's a, it's a process. And that process takes time because I create my, my strategies. Where are the parents? I need to see how I'm going to find them or where they are. And um, this is uh, the difficult part uh, for me as working, doing this job. But the other part, the other difficult part for the parents, uh, what, I, what I heard from the cohort, the past cohorts, they have, it's a lot of it's a lot of going on. It's the language, but it's a barrier. Um, the status is a barrier, and then um, find the resources and identify uh, if the kids uh, have any conditions and it, it needs to be evaluated. And they struggle a lot, a lot in many ways. And now that I'm doing this work, I. I'm receiving a lot of um, questions about different resources. Where I can find a wheelchair? Where I can? How uh, people can build a ramp in my house? Where I can have diapers for my kid that has disabilities? And it's a lot of questions. That means it's a lot of work to do. And the other thing uh, that for them is very hard is that way. Like uh, they get tired. It's too much work for them. And they have to keep stand up. They, they, must, they have to be, you know, have energy to put attention to the, their other kids that they don't have disabilities. So I can say the Latino community is struggling a lot with, if they have a kid with disabilities. So I can make a list and it's a long list, what I hear from them. So, but uh, besides that, um, I'm so happy like, um, different um, venues, different spaces open the door for us. And I appreciate that because it's helping for me to bring the message what we are doing in the community. How, I hopefully we can do more, but we starting, we starting, you know, building um, uh, some ways to help the community, but at least I, I, I'm proud of this last, this cohort that is running right now, that the cohort parents, they are very active, they, they, they are taking action. And three of the parents, they already um, asked for the evaluation in the schools, for the IEP, and then they are doing a lot of things by themselves because I'm providing them the tools and then they are advocating for by themselves for their kids. And this is something amazing for me as a, as a facilitator or working uh, with them. I'm so proud of them that they are really like strong and then, uh, you know, doing that kind of uh, changes in their life with their kids. They feel more more uh, empowered, yeah, uh, through, the, uh, through the cohort. Now they, they, they mention me a lot like, Reina, this is amazing. I didn't know about the ADA law. I didn't know about the IEP and my rights. I didn't know about special education, about the history. And yeah, I'm so proud of those parents uh, for all the cohorts. Yeah, they're doing a great job. And about the, the last question. Um, uh, What's the beauty of the Hispanic culture? What's the beauty culture, what you want people? Our culture is so beautiful in many ways. Music, um, you know, uh, gastronomy. Uh, history and art, uh, but uh, that's why I reflect 
I reflect that in the video that I'm going to share. Um, I think so we have time, four minutes. So <laughs> no time. And then I close. We can. Okay. But uh, let me see. This is the video. Let me see the volume. Let me see the volume first. Oh, you guys share. Use um, screen share enable the um, value or. You can you can see the video. Yeah, is is the uh, I can see it. Yeah, just have to. Okay, I'm gonna this. I'm gonna put enough volume if people can hear. I want to daily. Okay. Let me put that. Uh, okay. This is the video how I wanted to say how beautiful is my culture, how beautiful. Um, I feel so proud to be a Mexican, uh, a Mexican or how I raise my language, everything, and my connection with the Mother Earth that I inspire me all the time uh, to be a very human being. And, that's one I wanted to share with the public about these videos, very important for the Heritage Month um, to share. Oh, uh, it's, it's the conclusion of my life, how I feel right now after the resilience, the resistance and everything in my life, what I experienced as a girl with disability being and now. 50, 51 year old is how I feel. <laughs> yes, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Reina for uh, doing this with me, and, you know, for Hispanic Heritage Month. And I hope all of you, uh, you know, have uh, learned, you know, something. And, and please, you know, if you want to uh, support or to reach out to Raina, um, you know, where can they find you, Raina? What is your email um, uh, as well as people, if people want to get in touch with you? Okay, I don't know which email do you want, but I'm gonna get the FDRC email. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, Tamika. It's Reina at uh, myMDRC at dot org. You can reach me out there, and yeah, we can talk about whatever um, you wanna know about uh, uh, my work as a. Let I forgot my name in, in English. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. You can say it in the Latino Spanish. community and uh, around the topic of disability. So you can reach me out there, or uh, otherwise you, you can send a message to directly to the Facebook page Messenger. I can see also the message. I have access to see the messages. You can speak, you can share in, in Spanish, and uh, if you wanted to. I bring the messenger training for the general public. I can bring the master, uh, the influential messenger training. If you are interested in any space, I'm working on that too. So thank you, Tamika. Yes, thank you. Uh, see everyone next time. Okay, bye. Bye.